Welcome back to the Spectre Creative Channel with me, your host, Scott Toy Guru Nightlick. I'm a collector and a toy making professional, and today I want to talk about the water cooler effect and how it applies somewhat to collectors, but more so to kids and new properties. So let's jump in. So what is the water cooler effect? Well, the water cooler effect, as you might have guessed, is people gathering around the water cooler. And what do they do around the water cooler? Well, they discuss things at work because it's a communal area where everybody comes. One of the big things, though, that people will discuss at the water cooler when people are actually, you know, in person at work as opposed to home doing Zoom meetings, as we are when I'm recording this in January 2021, is it becomes a communal meeting ground, a place where everybody can come together and they'll discuss, among other things, what happened on TV last night. Or at least that's how it used to be. When TV was a communal experience where everybody would gather around and watch the TV because there'd be great events happening that everybody wanted to see together. Things like the moon landing, that, you know, more people gathered to watch that than any other event previously in the, well, the history of television. And it became the first communal TV event. And it would be the thing that, at work the next day, everyone would be talking about. Or an example of a uh, fictitious event that people gathered around to talk about would have been the, the M.A.S.H. finale. So M.A.S.H. was one of the, well, for those of you who have never heard of it, it was a very popular sitcom in the 70s. And the finale became a huge cultural event where... Essentially, everybody was watching it at once. In fact, 121 million people tuned in to watch the finale of MASH, which was one of the largest TV audiences. Other finales have also gathered this, though it hasn't necessarily been as impactful. Like, who can forget the finale for Sopranos and that amazing last shot that explained everything? And, okay, yeah, we were all left wondering what the heck just happened when we saw that shot. Maybe that's not the best example, but... Finales of TV shows are, in a way, traditionally fodder for these water cooler type events. Nowadays, of course, we're all at home and the work experience is a little different because we're Zooming and we're not connecting in person, so we've lost this to some extent. But what I really want to talk about today is the way the water cooler effect works for children and for getting them into properties and getting them into toys and getting them into, uh, you know, sort of becoming fans of things. So while kids don't have the office, they have the playground. And the playground functions the same way, where it's a time when all of the children in all of the different grades can get together in one place during recess and lunch, and besides playing, they talk, they communicate. And one of the things they'll talk about, or at least that they used to be able to talk about, was, wow, did you see what happened on XX Cartoon the other day? whether it's My Little Pony or He-Man or Transformers. And yes, I know I'm talking about back in the 80s, but that's kind of the point, and I'll get to that. The idea was things used to be scheduled. There used to be a specific time when your show was on and you had to tune into it and you had to look it up in the TV Glide. And yes, I said Glide. It's a Fireside Theater joke. And you had to find out when your show was on. And... Then you could tune in, and the next day, much like adults gathering around the water cooler to talk about Sopranos or MASH or, you know, whatever adult TV show, kids would talk about their shows. Just the same. The shows that we would watch as kids, especially in the 80s, were just as story-driven and just as meaningful. So if something amazing happened on an episode of G.I. Joe or She-Ra or Thundercats, whatever it was... That's what the playground would be talking about the next day. It would be the focus of class, and you might even have trouble listening to the teacher because you were so excited because such and such event happened on the show the night before. But as our culture has evolved, in a lot of ways we've lost this communal event. We no longer gather around the TV, but rather watching shows has now become binging. And this is the same for kids. We, and by we I mean all ages, will gather around and will watch shows, not one episode at a time, but will essentially engorge in the entire season all at once. And this is not because there is a plethora of streaming services now, which obviously there are, but 
binging really started in the 90s with DVD releases, when you could buy for the first time an entire show, and you could own all of the episodes at once. Previously, you could never do this. You just had to catch them on reruns, or the original premiere, if you will. But the thing with DVDs is you would have to physically put the DVD in your player and push it in and hit play and, you know, skip to the episode or choose your language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There was a little bit of human input needed. And there was also an ending point. And this is very important because when the DVD would end, like let's say there were six episodes on each DVD, well, the viewing experience would end for the moment. Versus now, when you have things on streaming, especially for kids shows, all the episodes are, for the most part, available all at once. Meaning, a kid can sit down and watch an entire series, and then it's basically, all right, thank you, next, what's next? I'm ready to binge my next show. I mean, I get this from my daughter all the time, saying like, oh, I need a new show to binge. In fact, her saying that was kind of what inspired me to do this video, because I realized that she was experiencing TV in this binging way. Now, it's not because there's too many choices, and obviously choices can be overwhelming, whether it's something to watch or something to buy. Because, well, I mean, heck, back in the 80s, we had tons of choices as well, but they were all on at a specific time. Of course, there would be shows that conflicted with others, and I remember many a Saturday morning arguing with my sister over which episode we were going to watch, whose show. But now that everything is on demand and everything can be watched in the binge format, it's different. There's no competition. You don't have to tune into a specific time. One sibling can watch a show for one half an hour, and then the next sibling can take over the next half an hour. There are shows, obviously, that do still come out weekly. Star Wars has done a good job of this, both with Clone Wars and The Mandalorian. And this slow drip, this having at least a week between episodes, makes a huge difference in terms of creating a fan community, specifically because the time period between episodes is time to discuss what happened. When there's no time to discuss, you lose that communal experience of sharing what you liked about the episode. And most importantly, this time period between episodes is what gives you room psychologically, to become a fan, because you're not alone. You are connecting with other fans and realizing, oh, we have things to talk about. We both liked what happened on this show, or we both didn't like what happened on this show, or we both hope this will happen on the show next time. This is why the weekly runout was so important. And it's also not that there's no more you know, things to be fans of. There's new IP coming out all the time that completely takes over pop culture. Harry Potter is obviously a good example. Ben 10 is also another one. In fact, before Ben 10, some of the major toy companies even felt that all of the great toy ideas were out there. It was done. No one should be coming up with new you know, intellectual property anymore. And then Ben 10 came along and changed that. So what do we do about this? Part of it is talking to your kids. And like I said, when my daughter came up to me and said, Daddy, I don't have anything else to binge, I realized that we had an issue and we needed to talk. So a lot of it is really just talking to your kids and finding ways to sort of separate out the amount of a show they watch all at once. But while that's good on one level, what it's not creating is that united shared gap. All the kids are racing to finish a series as fast as they can, as opposed to getting just a little bit each week, which is what allows them to talk about it on the playground, hence the water cooler effect, or what might rightly be called the slide effect or the jungle gym effect, because that's where kids gather to talk about what they saw. And without that shared communal experience of watching the show on a weekly basis, you lose this jungle gym effect or water cooler effect of discussing what you liked. And when you don't have time to do this, you lose becoming a fan. And this is why I believe a lot of toys these days are not capturing the imagination the way they did in the 70s and 80s when we had that communal watching experience and more importantly that time between the communal watching experience to 
talk with others' peers and become fans and get into the property, the toys, etc. Now it's just kind of move along, what's next? And without that shared communal experience, we risk losing fandom. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you have, please do leave a comment, subscribe, give it a like, because that tells YouTube to share this with other people, and that's really what this is all about, is sharing toy and pop culture love with as many people as we can. Thanks for watching, leave a comment, I'll comment back, and I'll see you in the next video.